<coughs> we have a fascinating discussion today, but before we get to that, I'm going to turn it over for the Executive Director's Report to Susan Barrett. And before I do that, I do want to um, recognize a member of the audience because it's always great to have a member from the General Assembly in attendance. So uh, one of the newest members, Lucy Rogers, is here. Uh, welcome. Come more often. <laughs> So with that, Susan? Great. So I uh, just have one announcement, and it's an agenda change. Uh, we had planned to uh, have a healthcare workforce presentation this afternoon starting at 2.50. We are taking that item off the agenda. We're, we've already rescheduled it to January 30th, and so that will be posted on our website. Is that it? That's it. And I see no minutes to approve. Yeah. There are? There's approval of minutes. Okay. So the minutes of Wednesday, January 9th, is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 9th without any, any additions, deletions, or corrections. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over to board member Dr. Jessica Holmes, who has really been the driving force behind the discussion today. And uh, it's one that uh, uh, I think uh, is going to be a fascinating one. So, Jess? Great. Thank you. Um, so I, before I introduce some of the our panelists today, I just want to give a little background into where this came about, why we decided to have this. Obviously, everybody knows that we're sort of entering this brave new world of healthcare payment delivery reform, and this is a world where we're moving away from cost plus volume-based fee-for-service reimbursement towards uh, value-based reimbursement. And so our all-payer model is already moving us in that direction where delivering high-quality, cost-effective care is effectively going to be the coin of the realm. So we need to learn all we can about ways to reduce waste and improve efficiencies and improve ultimately improve health outcomes for, for Vermonters. And Gunderson Health Systems uh, in Wisconsin has taken some really impressive steps towards uh, in this direction in the past few years. And some of you may have seen there was a Wall Street Journal article in August of 2018 that basically highlighted some of the intriguing process that Gunderson went through to really identify ways to improve efficiencies in their orthopedic practice and actually improve health outcomes. They took on an 18-month review an efficiency expert that followed all the doctors and nurses and, and looked at all the resources that were used to do a knee replacement and a very, very detailed cost accounting exercise. And in the article it describes how the list price for a knee replacement was about $50,000 and the actual cost amounted to about $10,000 once they really analyzed the true costs of it. And through efficiency gains, uh, identified about 20% more savings that could be achieved and help outcomes for their patients. So it was a fascinating article. I, I gave one of our speakers today a phone call, had a wonderful conversation with Rachel about this uh, process. So Rachel Albrecht is on the phone and is going to give a presentation to share with us some of the learnings that they had in this, in, in this process. Um, she's the Administrative Director of the Orthopedics, Podiatry, and Outpatient Therapies Units at Gunderson. Um, but I recognize, you know, in this conversation that some of the things that I've heard from Rachel, I had been hearing from other providers in the state, realizing that our entire state is going through innovative changes to how we deliver payment, I mean, how we deliver health care. And so we've also invited um, Drs. Macy and Arrows, I think Dr. Macy will hopefully be here soon, um, to talk about what they're doing at Copley and at, at Mansfield Orthopedics, which is known throughout the state as a center of excellence for orthopedics. So we want to learn and what they're doing, the innovative reforms that they are doing as well. And then Dr. Stephen Leffler and I have had several conversations in the context of the all payer model and had wonderful conversations about some of the innovative reforms that are happening at the health network around delivery reform and how do we improve outcomes for patients and reduce inefficiencies. And so some of the things that, that Gunderson was doing with respect to orthopedics is being done at UVM health network in areas of, of cardiac units. So, Lots of learning, lots of exciting things to learn about today. And so that's the point of this session. I'm very excited about it. And I'm very, very thankful that all of you took time out of your days to come here, especially those of you who I know who are you know, saving people's lives 
by the minute, so very, very appreciative. And Dr. Mel Boynton was very interested in being on this panel as well, and it was, I had a wonderful phone call with him learning about some of the work that's being done in Rutland along these lines. He is probably right now doing a knee replacement, um, so he was gonna try and call in after the, that was over. We didn't want to interrupt any of that. So, yeah, we didn't want to do that. So if, it's, if he could, he was gonna try and call in. So there might be some point if he jumps on the line. I don't know. So with that, um, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, if that's okay. Can you hear me, Rachel? Yes, I can hear you, thank you. Okay, so why don't we turn it over to you, maybe you can start us off and tell us about <coughs> all the learnings that you guys had in orthopedics there. Absolutely, well thank you for having me. This is exciting work. I'm excited to share the learnings we've had thus far. Um, but I also want to say that we are nowhere close to the end of our journey and we are excited to learn from others that have had other successes as we are to share our own successes. So I'm here to share um, some learning from our journey. I hope it's valuable to you, but I'm also very interested in hearing your feedback and you've also been pursuing to enhance the value to our patients and to our communities uh, from a healthcare perspective. A little bit about me. I've been with Gunderson about 12 years. My background is entirely uh, in business. I have no clinical background at all. At Gunderson, we have a dyad leadership model where each department has both an administrative director and a medical director uh, or department chair so that we are co-leading together. We are a physician-led organization. Our CEO is a physician. And at every level of leadership, we have physicians engaged in those leadership roles. So while I um, am the support level from the administrative side, everything we've done is in a partnership with our provider group. So I just need to make sure to say that. Right now, I, I have spent two years with our orthopedic dietary and therapies department. I have previously left our Heart Institute and also our Vision Services Department, Ophthalmology and Optometry. So a little bit about me, but if I can get now into, oh, now my presentation is working. There we go. A little bit about Gunderson Health System. So we are literally right on the Mississippi River. If you see the picture on the bottom right below, you'll see the Mississippi River is less than a mile from our main campus in La Crosse, Wisconsin. As a system, we see over a million clinic visits a year, have about a quarter of a million unique patients. Our tertiary care center in La Crosse, Wisconsin, our main hospital, has 325 beds. We have five critical access hospital affiliate partners. Uh, we, uh, we have affiliate uh, pharmacies, uh, emergency transportation services, skilled nursing facilities, we serve over 21 counties in three states. So we serve patients from Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa, primarily with close to 20,000 surgeries a year in our uh, six, lo six hospital locations. So that's just a bit about us as a system. We are a level two trauma center. We are a teaching hospital. Uh, we have 30, over 30 regional medical and specialty clinics also connected to our system. We do, uh, something important to note that I, I get a lot of questions on when I talk about our system is that we do have an employee position and provider model. So for the most, unless we have a handful of contracted providers, for the most part, all of our positions and associate staff are employees, which definitely um, sometimes changes your approach to how you move this kind of work forward. So why do we exist? We rely heavily on our strategic plan and our mission, vision, and purpose to drive our work. And a little over a year ago, in 2017, we transitioned our strategic plan to mirror our, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim, to focus on population health. And we've rewarded some of things to, to better align with our culture, but improve the health of our communities, really that's our population health work, to offer an outstanding experience of care, is our patient satisfaction, patient experience, and quality work, and ease the financial burden of healthcare, which is the cost of care per capita work you hear uh, from time to time. Some of you may have heard of the quadruple aim uh, that takes into account provider and staff management, and we have incorporated that through the center of our strategic plan. We talk about enriching every life we touch. That includes our providers, 
our staff, our patients, their families, and our community. Um, so you can see that the middle of our strategic plan is also in our vision that we will uh, enhance the health and well-being of our communities while enriching every life we touch, including patients, families, and staff. And so when you come to Gunderson, for the most part, if you ask someone what our purpose is, our purpose is to enrich everybody. So orthopedics has been on a journey, and I have been to the department it's close to years now, but this journey started um, many years ago and before my time, and I am carrying on this journey. But the department was very engaged in wanting to talk about value to our patients. How do we continue to enhance our quality and our safety and enhance the patient experience but reduce cost? Because our, our primary goal always is quality and safety for our patients and supporting our providers and our staff to deliver it high quality and safe patient care. But we knew we had to start working on the value side of the equation. And why did we have to start doing that? I think you heard from um, Susan in the beginning that the differences in the reimbursement environment, we are looking at capitation, uh, having a significant portion of our patients uh, migrating to a capitated model of care. So we, like many across the healthcare industry, have our feet into canoes. Uh, we still have close to 70% volume-based reimbursement in our fee-for-service patients, and but we're moving to a value-based system uh, with some capitated contracts, we are participating in several of the BPCIA Medicare bundles, and so we have we find ourselves with the challenge, as many do across the country, in tackling this and knowing that we we have our feet in two canoes. But our philosophy here at Gunderson is that we will treat patients the same regardless of payer. And actually, I don't want my providers to know what insurance the patient has when they're making treatment decisions. I want them to always make the best decision for the patient and the care they need. So our philosophy is that we need to drive quality, safety, but also value for all of our patients. And so we do, we do not take different approaches by care, and I think that's very important. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's been so easy for my provider group to get engaged in this, is they know that it is primarily about the patients and about our and I think that's very a very important part of the conversation. So our approach um, has been that we knew if we wanted to embark on this journey, we needed solid data. We needed real data. We didn't need averages or estimates or um, or looking at RBU valuing. We wanted real data, and to get real data, we needed to focus on time-driven activity-based costing. We needed to help our providers see really truly what is the cost of what we're doing. Because all day long you can look at averages and estimates and fake numbers, but, but that isn't really what's meaningful to driving change for us. And so we embarked on a journey, a one to two year journey of engaging our quality and improvement folks, practice organization to come in and pull our providers step by step through through their processes, and, and the initial focus was total knee and total hip replacement, primary. And so we looked at two factors. We looked at quality, and we looked at cost. And we looked at cost from a couple different angles. We looked at it from a time and resource perspective, from a people perspective, and we looked at it from a supply cost perspective. So this time-driven activity-based costing is a very time and resource intensive process. But it took the detail and the trust in the level of detail in the process for us to really get all of our providers on board to drive this change. You have bottom left hand side of the slide, uh, a, just some different kind of pro, uh, process map. So we spent a lot of time mapping out processes, looking for deviation in processes, and deciding what deviation and variation in process we would continue to support and what deviation um, we would look at standardizing. So there was a lot of time spent, a lot of uh, provider time spent coming to the table, talking about the deviations, and talking about where they were willing to come together and standardize. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, our approach to that. We spent a lot of time getting real cost for things, looking at the real purchase price of supplies, looking at the real cost of our staff, 
um, did a lot of time stamp methodology and who is in the OR wheeled in, who is still in the OR wheels out, what are they paid per hour, and so what is the cost of that case from a personnel perspective. Uh, so we did a lot of that really real costing um, to compute the total cost, and that's what we used as our driver. There are barriers, certainly, to rolling this up. Very costly, very resource intensive, and you're looking at a very micro level versus a macro level, and there are pros and cons certainly to that. It's hard to roll things out on a large scale when you're looking at it in such detail, and there are system limitations to having the support to do that. I think, though, that despite all of those challenges, the biggest challenge is the culture shift. So when I talk about this, I always look at people and ask, how comfortable would you be if your boss followed you around all day and looked over your shoulder and timed you and everything you did? Most people don't feel like that's something that they want to do or would feel comfortable doing, but, but we, we really did. We had people follow staff and time everything they did. And that took a culture shift of trust, that we're not doing, we're not pursuing this from a judgment perspective, we're pursuing this so that we can improve care for our patients and improve uh, the resources we have for our staff to deliver and providers to deliver that care. But the biggest challenge and barrier is culture. Having folks being willing to engage in the process, to trust in the process, and to know that it's not about judgment. And I think laying the groundwork for that on the end and making sure that everyone is on board from that perspective is probably the most important part of being successful in this work. So this is Gunderson Improvement System, we call it our GINS model. And on the left side, you'll see the leading change. And the right side, you'll see the managing change. And I always tell my managers, when we're leading change, the first two points you'll see on the left side are the most critical. They're creating the shared need and the shaping the vision. I call the creating the shared need is the why. Why do we even care about this? Uh, why should our providers care? Why should our staff care? We all need to be on board and understand the why so that we can get past that this isn't about judgment, this is about improvement. And so I recently presented with a colleague at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement on, on a similar topic, and we handed out copies of this. Um, because I carry this around with me every day um, to talk through with my managers and my staff what it means to lead change, to manage change, to drive change. And I think uh, this has been a valuable tool for or our organization. So some examples of process maps. They can be very simple. Uh, here, this is straightforward and simple, and you can see in yellow the time stamps for each of these areas. areas. And when, we, when the team looked at total hips and total knees, there were many, many process maps. There was the prior to pre-op process. There was the pre-op process, there was the intra-op process, the, the hospital stay, the post-op. So many different processes that we had to tackle when we were looking at improvement in this area. And here's another example with many storm clouds. So you can see each of those clouds would really potentially be a project and an area to tackle. So we had the right people at the table. We had a strong why and a strong need for change, and we had folks engaged in understanding that this wasn't about, this was about improvement. Folks needed to know what our goals were and where we were going. So we looked, started looking for benchmarks and metrics to, to gauge our success. We are currently participating with two different collaborative cohorts to look at benchmarking our success, and are we making the progress we should be Making, making, and do we have the right goals in view? And so we are keeping the why firmly in view. And each time we meet to talk about this, we start the why. Why are we here? Why is this still important to us? And why is it important to our patients and our community? We follow the PDSA or PDCA cycle. And I think that helps to bring people to the table because when we launch an improvement project or launch a change, it is not set in stone. And we try to let folks know that this is a constant evaluation cycle of change. We plan, do, study, or check, and act. And then we look again and say, did we get the outcomes we thought we would get from that change? And do we need to revisit it? 
And so it's a constant cycle of evaluating these changes, what's working, what's not. Something that might be working from the staff perspective isn't working from the surgeon's perspective. And so we need all voices at the table to reevaluate what we're doing, um, but always we start with the why. Why are we here? And so how, how did we get those folks at the table? We had a couple avenues to do this. We started a monthly multidisciplinary orthopedic leadership team meeting. Uh, it, was monthly, it was over the noon hour so that folks could try to get away for lunch. And we tried to have representatives from every point of care that that orthopedic patient would touch in our system. Surgeons, associate staff, anesthesia, hospitalists, uh, PTOT, staff from the floor, social work, staff from the OR, staff from pre-op, to come to the table. And the goal of that was to get everyone aligned with the why, to keep us aligned with the why, but to be a place to talk about deviation of practice and potential st standardization opportunities. So we meet every month. And it's a lot of open discussion about where are we still seeing deviation and where can we still improve. And those meetings are incredibly valuable. And every time we meet, new things come up and, and we tackle new initiatives. So in that meeting, we keep a running list of all the projects and initiatives that we are working. But really, we assign the doers and it's their uh, chance to take a lot of this work out, to own it, to push it forward, and to report back to this big group on the progress. So it's been an incredibly valuable meeting where it's a safe place, it's an open place, where we know we're all trying to tackle the same thing and we're on the same page. And, and that is, has been incredibly valuable. The other meeting we have is quarterly, all of the total joint surgeons, we go up to dinner, we go off campus so that there aren't distractions, uh, take them to dinner, down the group, and all of the ideas or practice deviations or variations that come up in that monthly orthopedic leadership meeting, we bring to this surgeon dinner, and we give them a safe place to talk to their colleagues about these variations and deviations and to hash out where do we go from here. So we, we have the multidisciplinary team, but we also have the quarterly surgeon meeting. In that meeting, they review how are we tracking on our average length of stay, our complications, our readmission, our other key goals such as PT day of surgery. Uh, we, one of our goals was to get all of our patients up and moving day of surgery, but there were some barriers to that um, that we felt were being driven by the pain management strategy that was used intra-op. So our surgeons talk about different pain management strategies they could try so our patients are able to get up and do PT day of surgery. So those uh, surgeon dinners, while it's a time commitment, and if we take them off site, we buy dinner, uh, the room, the restaurant, uh, they've been incredibly valuable because they've been relationship builders, but also they talk about practice variation and a safe place to get everyone to agree to a standard of care. So recently, we, we got all of our uh, seven surgeons that are doing total joints to agree on their anti-coag management protocol post-op, which we've never had all of them on the same page from that perspective in the past. So that will help our nurses on the floor know how to better educate our patients about their anti-coag post-op. It will help our patients, our staff in the clinic to know how to talk to our patients about their medications post-op when they're calling and making the post-op phone calls to check on the patient. There's an incredible value of getting those all of the surgeons on the same page with their post op anti coag management strategies. So just some examples of some outcomes of those meetings. So here you see some of the some of the specific the quarterly surgeon dinners. Um, they are very engaged and I will say it's unless one is on vacation or one's on call and we try to avoid those kinds they do all show up, they all come. They're all incredibly engaged. Usually we start meeting at 30. I don't know that there's ever been a time where we've left before 8.30. They all are usually at least three hours long. We discuss practice variations. We discuss any new literature or best practices any of them have identified and what we should think about rolling out in our organization. The monthly leadership team meetings are the truly multidisciplinary meetings, there's usually at least 20 people in those meetings. Uh, the focus is that it's a constant plan, do, study, act uh, for our uh, 
uh, change management. And we open that meeting with this slide. And again, it's to align us all on our purpose. Why are we here? Our purpose of these meetings is to make sure we are delivering quality and safe patient care and excellent service to our patients and their families. That is our primary goal, to support our staff and providers in doing that and to decrease the financial burden of care for our patients and our community. And so this meeting is to ensure alignment, collaboration, and engagement to achieve those things. The scope is all orthopedic related issues and topics. We started with a focus on total knees, total hip, ongoing work. Um, we are now taking on more intentionally uh, primary shoulder replacements and hip fractures because those are two of the VTCIA bundles we are participating in. But really, any ortho related issue or topic is uh, fair game for this meeting. I think another important factor here in the success we've had is transparency and data. So we, at the certain dinner, we put up all the readmissions and all of the complications on the screen. We put the patient's information and we put the surgeon's information and we talk about them very transparently. And all of the surgeons have been open to that. We also share surgeon level data at the ortho leadership team meeting. Again, to, to say where are the variations it's not at all from a place of judgment, from a place of how do we all get better together. And so, so I think that the culture around that is pretty significant when we talk about putting readmission data, complication data, or comparing surgeon supply costs in the OR. Um, that those are, that's significant for all the surgeons to get on board and say I'm comfortable with you sharing my data at that level. We try to have very real-time data, so we have monthly uploads into the tool we're using to uh, both uh, kind of crunch our own data, but also compare to our peer group. And we use a tool that gives us the ability to quickly dig into the details if we see outliers, what do those mean? But again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to consistently layer that this is about improvement, and it's not about judgment. And any, um, most of the bumps we've come across in this process when it starts to feel more like judgment than about it. And so we're always trying to layer and remind ourselves that it is about it. So we've had a lot of projects then that have come of this. We have had supply cost and standardization projects. Um, several years ago, even when this was more of an informal than a formal process, all of our uh, total joint surgeons agreed to a state, to one vendor for all of their knee and hip implants, unless it was a, a revision or a special case that they did to deviate. So that was a significant impact to our supply cost, getting all of our surgeons on the same page with their implants. Um, another example would be moving away from drains and calves. So our, our students all decided to move away from using drains, to move away from using calves, um, so that was another standardization opportunity. Practice changes, uh, the AFOA was a significant practice change. Uh, PT day of surgery, that was a practice change. We had to have our PT and OT groups at the table um, because some of our patients were going to the OR later. We had to um, work with our PT OT department and they had to change their shifts to staff PT OT later to explain our patients that were going to the floor later. And so now I, we're, we uh, go back and forth between being at 80 to 90% PT day of surgery. We track every single patient that wasn't able to do PT on day of surgery and why we feel like they weren't able to do that. Um, ongoing, from a practice change perspective, we have ongoing trials related to intra pain management strategies, um, using blocks and, and different things to, to try to uh, maximize our patient's comfort and from a certain perspective, but also to what will allow them to get up and be successful in key day of surgery. So we have ongoing trials on intra pain management that are going on that our surgeons are leading with anesthesia as a partner. From a process change perspective, we've done a lot of work on our patient education process. So we have uh, gotten a lot of our information online. We have created DPs. We have engaged PTOT to be a part of our total joint camp, our class. Um, and I think a lot of organizations are doing that. But an innovation that came from our floor nurses was that they felt one of the uh, 
um, most important factors in the success of patients going home and being successful at home was that their caregivers were educated on the care they would need when they got home. And so our floor nurses started holding uh, a caregiver class every morning at 845. They pull all of the caregivers together that are there. They let them know the day ahead of time that they need them there at 845 the next morning. And they talk about, um, they talk about medications. They talk about incision care. They talk about uh, constipation, what to do. They talk about who to call if there are questions. So they cover five or six very key areas that really need those caregivers to be very clear on before they leave the hospital with their loved ones. We are uh, discharging the majority of our patients. I think we're up to close to 60% home on day one, so day after surgery. And that is a significant shift from where we were two years ago. I'd say two years ago, we were sending no one home day one almost. And now we're sending almost 60% of our patients home day one. So that's been a significant shift for us. We have a lot of areas that are work in process or progress. Um, we are working very hard on developing a plan to better engage our post-acute care partners. Uh, we are participating in several bundles, and it's a 90-day all-inclusive bundle, and post-acute care is a critical piece of the picture for our patients and the success of our patients uh, post-discharge. So we are working on a potential plan for partnership with our post-acute care partners. So those are just some examples of some of the projects and changes we have worked through this process of So some of our results, actually this is this data is a bit older. You can see our things on the inpatient cost side, much of that is because of the today. Um, we've also been able to reduce our post-acute care costs by encouraging patients to go home and not to go to a nursing home, trying to get them optimized and the right resources prior to surgery so that they are successful in going home instead of to a post-acute care facility. You can see that we've reduced our length of stay quite significantly and we're tracking at less than a two-day length of stay pretty significantly now, or pretty regularly and consistently. We are up to uh, 80 to 90 percent PT day of surgery. Um, before we were doing no PT day of surgery. So that has been a significant shift, and that has been one of the greatest drivers in our patients being able to go home day one. And you can see that we've reduced our utilization of skilled nursing facilities quite significantly as well um, by trying to get ahead of education with our mm -hmm. patients to set them up for success going home. So we, we have had a lot of positive outcomes from, from this work from a cost perspective. But we have had challenges, and we do have a lot of plans to continue to move forward and to spread this. <laughs> but a lot of the most significant challenges are related to culture. And culture takes time to shift, and trust takes time to build. So when you talk about shifting from a judgment model to an improvement model, that takes time. And so we are still on that journey. I would say we are much better than where we were. We are sharing data openly and Apparently we're talking about it, we have the right people at the table, but that is an ongoing journey. Resource management and allocation, um, a lot of the work we've done has been very resource intensive. We are an integrated health system, there are a lot of big service lines looking for similar support. So of course resource management and allocation is always a challenge um, in working through these, these kinds of changes. The changing landscape of healthcare I think is a challenge for all of us and the impact to our patients. And we want to keep that firmly in view. Anything we do, we talk about what, what is the potential impact for our patients. And we try to keep that firmly in view, both from a care quality outcome perspective, but from a financial perspective as well. And uh, spreading change and improvements across the system can be challenging. We, we know that. Uh, we have many folks here at our main campus in La Crosse performing total knee and hip replacements, but we have several surgeons working out in our region and performing these same surgeries at our critical access hospitals and even some at non-Gunderson non, um, hospitals. So how do we spread the change uh, to our critical access partners, but also to our non-Gunderson partners that are also supporting us and delivering the same kind of care to our patients? So that is an ongoing journey on how we keep everyone aligned. Uh, I, I will go back and say we have tried some things that haven't worked, and I think a lot of times when we talk about these things, we talk a lot about what has worked, but we don't always talk about what hasn't worked. 
And so I can share an example with you of, of something we tried that didn't work, and that was asking the hospitalists to manage our knee patients. So typically, our orthopedic teams are attending and take on primary management of our um, total knee total patients. We did a trial of the hospitalists taking this on, thinking that that may impact length of stay. They could get them out of the hospital sooner. We weren't waiting on the, um, the provider team to get out of the OR and get to the floor to write discharge orders. And we found that that change was counterproductive. <coughs> We're very busy. The hospitalists already had a lot on their plates and a lot on their cards, and they were very willing to be partners with us in this. But it did not positively impact length of stay um, or or uh, impact the quality and since we were able to deliver to our patients, so we reversed that change. So we have had learnings of, of, that tried that didn't work, and I think that's part of the trust and uh, improvement culture we need to build is that if something isn't working, it doesn't mean we've committed to it forever. And it really is a PDSA plan to study act cycle of looking at the changes we've made and saying, are they working or aren't? So we are still solidly on this journey. Uh, we are close to in a maintenance phase right now with our total hips and total knees, and we are focusing right now on our processes around hip fractures and shoulder replacements. Um, but we found opportunities in other areas. So um, I can share a couple learnings that we've had and that we're trying to spread to other areas. Our total, our total joint surgeons brought literature forward that talked about value of using antibiotics and uh, pre-mixed antibiotic cement is more expensive than plain cement or plain cement plus adding something like bank powder and mixing in the OR. So my total joint surgeons agreed they would trial moving from antibiotic cement to the plain cement with the bank powder in the OR. That worked very well. It saved about 60 some dollars a case or something like that. Extrapolated out based on our volume, it was a 40 to $50,000 savings a year. And I, I asked for a report on who else in the OR was using antibiotic cement and learned that podiatry was, which is also in my scope of leadership. And so I went to my podiatrist, shared the data with them, and said, would you consider moving to a different model of, uh, of cement? And they were fully on board immediately when I put the cost and put the data in front of them and told them what the conversation was with the orthopedic total joint surgeon. So we are still looking at how we roll out these changes more broadly across our organization. And I think that that is a good thing. Um, we still want to maintain a level of autonomy for our care providers. We know that we are not a factory. We know that we uh, need to customize care to our patients in some cases and allow surgeons and physicians and providers to have um, autonomy and discretion in their practices. So um, my department chair right now is one of my shoulder surgeons, one of two surgeons here at Gunderson that do total shoulders. And his cost per case was higher than my other shoulder surgeon's cost per case. So I brought the data to him. We talked about it from a supply cost perspective, and he felt like the implant he was using, he could defend why he was using it, and so I said, okay, um, that's fine. Can I move forward with renegotiating our contract on those implants to see if we can get savings from that perspective if you're not interested in, in standardizing our implant right now with the other surgeons? So we took that approach. We were allowing the, the differences in implants for our shoulder surgeons, but renegotiated the contract and had a significant amount of savings from that perspective. Purple tunnels, we saw that one of our hand surgeons' purple tunnels were costing about twice as much as the other. So I sent my program manager to the OR and said, I need you to go and see what's happening in the OR. And I need you to take a notebook and write down what's going on. And the learning in going to the OR and seeing what was happening was that one surgeon was using a blade. It was about a $90 blade, a specialized blade, but was only needing it 50% of the time. He only needed it when he was doing a patient's right hand. Um, and he didn't need it when he was doing the left, but the OR staff, in an effort to support the surgeon and have everything ready when he needed it, was opening it every time. 
So there was a waste of close to $100 on 50% of the cases because the blade wasn't utilized. And so we went to the surgeon, talked about the situation. He was very okay with that being PRN on his preference card. We did some, some uh, education with the OR staff on what it meant if something was PRN and, and making sure we're not opening things unless we know we need them. And so that saves uh, close to $100 a case on 50% of this hand surgeon's cases. But it took my manager going to the OR, seeing what was actually happening and talking to the staff and the surgeon to drive that change. So those are just some, some other examples of change we've driven in other areas that has been successful. So uh, that's a little bit about our journey. Again, we're still solidly on this journey. We still have a lot to learn and we still have a long way to go, but I think the key to uh, our success thus far has been the engagement of providers and staff at all levels. The willingness to share information, the willingness to come to the table from a place of improvement and not judgment, um, and knowing our why is that we all care about our patients and we all care about our community and we all care about driving value from that perspective. So with that, I will take any questions or comments and I am very excited to learn anything I can from you as well. Well, thank you, Rachel. This is Jessica speaking. Um, thank you so much. That was fascinating, interesting on so many levels. I appreciate it. We all, I'm sure, appreciated hearing about the process the successes and even some of the failures. I thought I would actually, before we turn it over to the board and public questions, I thought I would actually invite the panelists, if you have questions, I mean, to the extent this is a shared, you know, uh, information session, to the extent that you have questions for Rachel, I bet we would learn from those questions as well. So if you have any questions, I would welcome you to ask them. Hi, Rachel, this is Dr. John Macy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, that was a great presentation, thank you very much. So I'm really encouraged with how you start with why. That's hugely important. And the cultural shift that you emphasize is key to this whole process. So some specific questions that I have. One is what electronic medical record system do you currently use? And what do you use for data analytics? Because that's a make or break for all of us. It is. So we are on Epic. Epic. Uh, and so. Uh, we run Epic both on, uh, in all of our critical access hospitals, except one I think is going live this month, last month. Um, we are in Epic in the hospital and in the clinic. Yeah. From a data analytic perspective, we have tackled that a couple different ways. Gunderson participates in a, a Wisconsin State Collaborative called About Health. And I'm happy to send Christina and Susan the link that they can share about the goal of About Health, but. About Health is six organizations across the state of Wisconsin, some names you might be familiar with, Aurora, Theta, ProHealth, Bellin, Aspirus, and Gunderson, those are the six. And the whole, the entire goal of About Health is to drive improvement in healthcare in the state of Wisconsin. So while we are technically competitors in some areas, we don't approach that collaborative from a place of competition, we approach it from a place of uh, quality and value. And so, all six institutions upload their data on the areas that they've agreed to tackle, um, either monthly or quarterly, and we talk about who's improving the fastest, who has strong outcomes, we share best practices, and that has been um, an incredible process to share with other folks in the Midwest on what they're doing that has been uh, helpful. So one of the first about health collaboratives uh, tackled total needs. And so, so that is something that has been very valuable. I'm happy to send a link on uh, more about about health. The other data analytics we're utilizing is uh, a, a Harvard startup that came from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. It's a project that started at IHI and was turned over to uh, Harvard Business School, uh, and they started an organization called Avant Garde. And I can send a link to them with uh, their information as well. Avant-Garde started with building a platform to look at analytics related to orthopedics uh, and neurosciences because two areas that had kind of the most in the initial mandatory and voluntary CMS bundle were orthopedics and neuro. And so, 
Gunderson was one of the initial partners of Avant Garde to help them build this tool. And in Avant Garde, I can look at any of my orthopedic procedures and see what my costs are and how I uh, and what my outcomes are. So readmissions, complications, and see how I'm tracking on those things against our collaborative. And that is a nationwide uh, collaborative. That is not. Uh, a geographic specific, it's not just the Midwest, so many organizations across the country are participating in that. Um, then we in we upload all of our data to Avant-Garde, including Epic timestamps, and it's Avant-Garde that came on site with us and did all of the process tracking. Who's in the OR when uh, wheels in, and what are they all paid by the hour? Who's still in the OR wheels out? Um, and timestamping all these things, and we update uh, up load all of our supply costs to Avant Garde too, so they directly map our costs for each case based on the EPIC timestamp and the supply costs we're uploading. So it's very real data, and, and the comparisons are pretty reasonably apple to apple. If we are not uh, finding that we are in the top quartile in a specific area, I can reach out to my Avant Garde contacts and say, I am really interested in what or, or other organizations are doing related to length of stay, because we are tracking at only the 20th percentile, and they will hook me up on a conference call with those that are at the 90th percentile so that I can learn from them. And so Avant Garde has been the tool we've chosen. Now, there are many tools you can use uh, for that same thing, um, but I would say that the most important part of why we've been able to get our surgeons and providers on board with looking at the avant-garde data is because it was such an intensive process to get the data uploaded and get it validated on the front end. Hi, Rachel. Um, my name is Brian Arrows. I'm one of the uh, orthopedic docs at Mansfield. Thanks for your presentation. I, I just have a question. With, with the avant-garde and, and the project you, you, you completed or, and have ongoing, how did you finance the analytics and uh, pay for the potential increased cost to look at this information? Right, that was not cheap. Um, I think at the time that was, a, that was not me that pursued that, but I think knowing that the uh, reimbursement model in our industry will be changing significantly from a volume to value base, we knew we needed to get our arms around this, and orthopedics, I think, volunteered to be a starting place for that for the organization. We knew that knees and hips, was, if bundles came out, would likely be bundles. Um, and we knew we had a high enough volume of knees and hips that if we could get our arms around cost, we could drive significant change. So yes, was there, and is there an ongoing investment in that tool? Absolutely. Have we seen the return on investment over and over again? Yes, we have. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Hi, Rachel. It's Steve Leffler. And so I just wondered, um, do you have a process for how you pick the next project you're going to do? Do you do some kind of analysis? Do you just happen to notice that shoulders were expensive and your boss uses an expensive joint? Or is there a mechanism you use to make your decisions? Right. So, you know, I look at this from two perspectives when I'm looking at my data. I look at high volume procedures and I look at high dollar procedures. So. You can have something that's a low volume but very high dollar, and even if you only do it 20 times a year, if you can save $3,000 20 times a year, that's significant. My carpal tunnel cost was anywhere from $100 to $300. The potential savings was $100 to $150. Seems small, but when I'm doing hundreds of them a year, that adds up. So I started by looking at what are my high volume areas and what are my high dollar areas. And where do I have engagement for my surgeons to look at these things? And that's how I started. But you're the one making the decision. It doesn't go in front of a committee or something? Um, it's my department chair, um, Dr. Steve Klein, who is a shoulder surgeon, and myself looking at the data and making the decisions on who we want to talk to. Um, now, I say just because Dr. Klein and I identify that something may be a, a, a very good thing to pursue, we always put it in front of the providers and the surgeons to say, are you willing to look at this? And most of the time they are. Very infrequently have I heard no, but we don't take it to them and say, you have to look at this or you have to change. We bring the data to them and many times there's an element of competition. And so if there's a surgeon that has a much higher cost than another, Typically, they're willing to come to the table and talk about that, especially because, again, we're approaching
approaching it from a place of improvement and not judgment. And so, for the most part, they know that if, if it comes down to, well, they're using a more expensive implant and they're not willing to um, concede on that right now, that we likely will not push the envelope up. So I, I think it starts from a place of trust as well. Uh, and, and that we all know that we're doing this to improve care and the value of care for our patients. So I, I can't recall a time actually where I brought this forward to a provider or surgeon for consideration and have just been told no. Rachel, I'm a shoulder surgeon. I did two shoulder replacements this morning before this meeting. What implant system does he use? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, he's in a case right now. He was going to try to join me here, but he's in a case also. So I actually don't think that's what he's using right now. I, I couldn't say. Like... So I, on a more serious note, one of the biggest problems we have in Vermont is we have two academic medical centers, one at Dartmouth, one in Burlington. And we have several community hospitals around. And trying to get everybody on the same page or even in the same canoe is extremely difficult. It's worse than hurting cats. Do you, I know you're, you're embarking on trying to move your project outwards into the community. And how do you engage these, the community physicians with your group or the, even the non, um, the, um, your non-Gunderson providers? Yeah, that's a challenge, and so in a lot of ways, we're very lucky that all of the surgeons I'm working with right now are employed surgeons. And even the surgeons that we have employed out in our regional locations, are, they're, they're employed. Um, so when we have these regular quarterly dinners, it's not just my surgeons here at Maine campus, it's also my regional surgeons that come to the table. And actually, those regional service surgeons don't even report up to my service line, they report up to a regional service line, so I have even less kind of control, and Dr. Klein has less control, but they've seen the value that the collaboration and the, uh, the multidisciplinary approach has had, and so they do make it a priority to come to these meetings, and they do work very hard to bring forward uh, literature, best practices, and to implement change across the system and not just here at main campus. Um, now I will say that part I think of of getting them engaged is we do take them off site. We take them to a very nice dinner. It's a three hour dinner. Uh, it, it, and, and I think that helps. And they look forward to that collegiality, the, cha the respectful challenging of one another. But it's a place they can safely talk about their practices, not from a place of judgment. And they feel very supported in that. So we haven't engaged any non employed physicians or surgeons because. Frankly, we don't, we don't have any. Our biggest competitor here actually in town is Mayo Clinic. So Mayo um, runs our competing local lacrosse hospital in Rochester, Minnesota, is a little over an hour away. Um, but all of the orthopedic surgeons in our region, for the most part, are employed there by Mayo or Duggars. So to follow up on that, how do you incentivize employed physicians uh, do you, is there some part of their salary that is uh, secondary to quality metrics or is there, are there bonuses or, uh, I don't need specifics, but I'm just wondering, you know, how, to get these people to the table and engage, you need to incentivize them, right? So I'm wondering what... So I, yeah, great question and I will answer that with a story. Two years ago, Avant-Garde puts on a, a annual conference and invites all of their cohort folks to come together in Boston. And it's a two-day blitz of what is everyone doing, what's working, what's not, what are best practices. It's, it's incredibly valuable. And two years ago, I went for the first time. And the very last session was about game sharing. So we had a day and a half of very exciting, uh, engaging, empowering, invigorating conversation about value for our patients, outcomes for our patients, all of the things that we get excited to talk about. And the very last conference was around gain sharing. So if you're successful in the bundle and you're getting the bonuses, who gets that money? Or, or if uh, the surgeons come together and agree to standardize their implant and you're saving $2,000 in implants, how much of that savings goes to the surgeon? And I can tell you, my department chair at the time which is a different department chair than I have right now, there was very uh, 
very lively conversation about this, and he raised his hand and he said, at Gunderson, we believe in passing the savings along to our patients and to our community. So there isn't an incentive, except that our surgeons feel like this is the right thing to do because our patients are their neighbors and they live in these communities too. And, and they want to see us reducing the cost of healthcare for our communities and not pass along financial burden to our patients. And so um, our orthopedic surgeons are on a production model for their uh, compensation, but there has been no financial incentive for them to participate in this project. Does that answer your question? Y yes, thank you. All right, so I think what I'll do is, any questions from the board? I just have a, um, one question in terms of the kind of three areas that you emphasized, um, practice changes, process changes, and uh, supply cost standardization. Do you have uh, any rule of uh, kind of generalization you can make in terms of, of what proportion uh, each of those contribute to the results that you're getting? Well, I think the practice change is probably the greatest contributor because that drives the process and the supply change. If our if our surgeons aren't willing to change their practices, then likely we won't be very successful in changing process and supply costs. So, um, you know, I think that probably is the biggest um, opportunity. What's our process for deciding on an implant vendor? What's our process for post-op management? Uh, or the practice of post-op management that the surgeons are willing to support because that impacts the process of our nurses. So our surgeons recently moved away uh, from using warfarin and their post-op anti -coy. That is a significant uh, change in practice for our nurses who are having to spend a lot of time managing INR. So, so supply cost savings and process savings is driven by the surgeons agreeing to practice. I, I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Um, yeah, I just had one. I think um, this has been a great analysis and I love the conversation that we're having here because I had a lot of the same questions that um, John was asking about, you know, how do you incentivize people and, you know, what are the analytics and how do you support this from a staffing? So I think it's gonna be, have, be things that we'll be looking at. But one of the questions I had for you, when you talked about the gain sharing, I was a little surprised that I would expect when you have these significant cost savings that a portion goes back to the patient, but you would think a portion was going either to invest in new initiatives or to offset inflation costs and to offset other things. Because I, I do think you kind of need that way to incentivize everybody to participate. And usually when you do a cost savings program, there's a piece that you know you pass on to the, the consumer and there's a piece that you know gets shared throughout the organization to you know get everybody invested in participating. So I was a little surprised that you're saying that wasn't necessarily going back that way. Right, and so it's, it's not a one-to-one -one at Gunderson. So because we've saved X number of dollars in our total needs, we haven't decreased the price of the total need necessarily by that X dollars. Any cost savings we have as an organization, I'll say essentially gets um, spread across the organization and allows us to um, have less fee increases over time as a system, or even in some cases to decrease our fees across the system. So, we have a strategy to, one of our key drivers is reducing the cost of care for our community. One of our goals is to uh, keep our fees steady and in some cases reduce our fees. It might not mean that, that that's the case for total needs specifically, but we're a system. So uh, savings in uh, total needs may help us reduce the cost of a procedure in another area. Um, so I think, I think that's important. That we, we approach a lot of that kind of work from a system perspective, not from a procedure or departmental perspective. Um, and so that may be a bit of the difference. We we have not done game sharing um, with providers. I think that that, uh, when we entered into VPCIA, uh, you had to, to uh, outline how, how you would uh, 
distribute the incentives or what your contract was with your physicians. And we said, well, we don't, we don't have one. They're employed and there's no incentive to drive quality or um, value or cost reduction. So I think my, and I'm very proud to say that all of my surgeons are very, very invested in the why. The why of our organization to care for our community, to care for our patients. And that's a key driver for them. And that's a culture we're building here at Gunderson that, that we're doing these things to improve the health of our community. And by the health of our community, we mean the financial health also. And that's part of our role. We are one of the biggest employers in the lacrosse community. So our staff are our patients. And that, um, I think that drives a lot of the conversation. Okay, thank you. I think what we'll do is put the, hold the public comment towards the end um, so we can keep moving through these presentations. So Dr. Macy and Dr. Ariel, I'm thrilled that you're here. I think I'd uh, love to hear, you know, Mansfield Orthopedics and Cobb, are well known as a center of excellence for orthopedics in the state. So hearing some of the innovative things that you all are doing is helpful. Um, and also, if you could share a little bit about, obviously, and you've pointed to a little bit to this, you're a critical access hospital. You don't have the deep pockets that a Gunderson Health Systems has to do the sorts of data analytics and efficiency analysis that obviously was done there. So I'm wondering a little bit if you could talk to speak to how might we learn from other hospitals and apply it or can it be applied to a critical access hospital in Vermont? What are, you know, and also what are, tell us about some of the innovations that you are already doing. We'd love to hear about them. So thank you. One of the first things that we've done is trying to really make our OR more efficient. And we started about a year and a year ago, maybe. So we formed a new committee called the Torque Committee, the OR Committee. It's real original. Um, but it, what it does is it, it gets surgeons, it gets a perioperative director, it gets um, CSP people, it gets um, um, uh, implant people at the table talking about all of these different problems and issues and trying to synthesize some standardization and trying to put some way to to make it more efficient and, and particularly from a cost standpoint. So we're really excited about the results that we've seen from some decreased costs, from improved efficiency, from higher use of our OR, from being extremely busy. It, it's a difficult problem to deal with. Uh, so we're, we are very strapped with the demand for our services is huge and our ability to provide those services is limited. And that's due to essentially our facilities and our ability to utilize our staff appropriately. Trying to manage that is a very difficult task given the demand. If we didn't, if we had half the demand, it would be a different story. So that's been, that's been very beneficial for us, and I think Brian is actually on that committee as the chairman of our surgery department. Um, things we've done to really improve our outcomes is, is really starts with patient education. We do a tremendous amount of patient education, setting their expectations early. Joint classes, uh, as Rachel described. Um, education at the bedside, uh, nursing education. Uh, caregiver ed education is a, big part of that. Uh, they, some of them do go to joint cap classes. Uh, some of the patients, all the patients go, for, at least for knees and hips, not for shoulders. It's a little more difficult. Um, and you have to have the numbers. You can't do 50 joint replacements a year and expect to have a joint class once a week that's going to provide efficiency. So you need to have a certain number of procedures to say you need 200, 300 knee replacements a year to be able to set up a joint class that's actually going to make some sense that you can get 10, 12, 20 people going to uh, from a financial standpoint. Um, we use health, home health and VNA services less. Our patients are getting more educated in the hospital preoperatively during their stay and immediately afterwards and our services our use of those services are less. So that, that's one place we've saved money. We're, we're sending patients less to inpatient rehab. Uh, that has saved a lot of money. Post-acute inpatient care is hugely expensive. It's, if you look at these, these um, bundled payments and the, the, the whole cost of, of a service, implants is a huge portion of it. Post-acute care is a huge portion of it. 
Hospital services is another big portion. Uh, the surgeon speed, by the way, is only about 8%. So, you know, it's just, go ahead. just a little plug. No. I, I think there, there are several process things that we've been working on. We're very fortunate in that we do have a small community hospital with an incredibly uh, talented staff and a culture that makes it work. It drives it. Our culture, all the way from our CEO down through our COO, down through our surgeons to our staff level people, is awesome. We had people in the other day, some financial people looking at the OR, looking at how things were working. The comment at the end by the business guy was, this was an amazing visit for many reasons. But the number one reason was, everybody here is smiling. The employees and the patients obviously were too. So that, that really drives home the point. I think, as Rachel said, it's all about the culture. It, it's about determining the why and then sticking to that. So I think those are some of the specific things that we're working on. Brian has some other things, and we have lots of other things planned, but we have um, some constraints that we'd love to talk about. So good afternoon. Uh, Brian Arrows, I'm one of the ortho uh, partners at Mansfield. Um, so I, I echo what John has said. And in addition, the, uh, the TORC committee, which is the OR committee of Copley, um, actually uh, came about. And one of the important things, I think, it's, it's, it has total buy-in from our administration. And I think that's why it works. And so we sit around providers uh, and administration and discuss exactly what John's talking about. Utilization, costs, where are we now? Where do we think we should go? Where do we need to go? And I think that's important. Um, since I joined, the, I joined Mansfield uh, in 2011, I've been employed there since. And since 2011, I can just say, and I don't have a slide with specific numbers, our length of stay has decreased now where I can be pretty confident and say that it is definitely greater than 60% of our patients go home by post-op day one. Our partial knee replacements, near 98% of them go home the same day. And so some of what has allowed that to occur is a quarterly group meeting uh, that's multidisciplinary uh, set up initially and, and headed by one of our partners, currently unfortunately not able to be here, Brian Huber, uh, would sit down with our nursing staff, our physical therapist, OT, actually nursing staff, to discuss the care processes that we would need to go through in order to make that, that length of stay shorten. And so these have been ongoing discussions uh, that have started way back in 2011 as far as meeting quarterly with our group, including the PAs that are part of the team. And I think that has been, and we're now seeing this now, I've been there eight years, over the past two to three years where our length of stay is really reducing. John's comment on sniff care. I actually, in the last six months, probably can count less, uh, on one hand, the number of times a patient of mine gets discharged to an inpatient acute facility after leaving our hospital. Uh, and the information that we have gotten uh, from some of the skip measures as far as our readmission rate is lower than what the national averages would be. So not only do I feel we are moving forward with you know, regular meetings and discussions with the team members, but I think I do feel, and we can definitely report back with numbers, that our length of stay has reduced. Our readmission rate is less than national average. And I think as we move forward with the committee that we have in place, um, teaming with our administrative staff, I, I just see very good positive outcomes uh, uh, for us down the road at trying to nail down where these costs are and looking at trying to hopefully reduce the overall costs um, for our arthroplastic care, hip, knees, and then shoulders at Copley. Um, I will say, I did learn, you know, as far as uh, uh, the presentation by Gunderson, we do have a joint replacement class, and we're fortunate enough that we do have uh, enough volume that we can hold this. And I know that uh, John and I have uh, brainstormed, but just looking at ways, way to, uh, ways of utilizing online resources, I think the caregiver class is a wonderful idea. Um, that's something that we don't specifically have at Copley, it's more joint with the patient, uh, but we have caregivers that are visiting our patients uh, when they're there all week, and, and that's actually an interesting idea. So I guess what I'm getting at is these conversations where we learn from another system, uh, I'll be able to take this back and actually talk with our nurses because there are ways during the week when our patients are there for 
although it's a short period of time, that morning after there could be a quick meeting uh, that all of the caregivers get together and, and disseminate some of that same information. I can actually just see that being more efficient. So each nurse, instead of going through it with each patient and their caregiver, they get it in one session. Okay. And so I, I think just looking at as we move forward, having a forum uh, where hopefully we could get together with other programs to share uh, ideas. I, I speak with colleagues uh, across the country, and mainly I end with one, one comment, and most of them are doing arthroplasty. What is the single most thing that you've done in the last six months that's giving you the most bang for your buck? And it could be something simple to how they express their gratification, uh, how one hospital system decided to hang uh, a magnet uh, next to the handicap plates where anyone from the birthing center could park here so you get to park in the front row for the next three weeks. And so I think that's helpful. And what, what that's just getting at is I think ongoing communication even across state lines uh, to look at what other healthcare systems are doing uh, and hopefully we can develop a model future uh, will enable to foster that uh, cost savings reduction and ultimately improve quality. Thank you. I'd like to just uh, talk about one example that really improves the patient experience that nine out of 10 patients on that first post-operative visit talk about. Karen, our perioperative director, started this thank you for choosing Copley card. It's a blank card that starts in the clinic and is signed by everybody that sees that patient. It comes to registration in the hospital it goes to the pre-op area, it goes to the OR, and it goes to the PACU. And every nurse, every staff member, anybody that signs these things, and then it's mailed to the patient, they get about three or four days after their surgery. They open it up, it's personalized by about 10 to 15 to sometimes 20 different people. All the best, whatever, you know, glad you're, you, you know, uh, all the best on your recovery. It, it personalizes it so much. We've done this now for, I don't know, six months or so, maybe more, and the number of patients that comment on it is incredible. The other thing I do is I call my patients two days after surgery. Every single patient, not every patient, but it, most of my patients, I learned this from Doug Campbell, one of my mentors in my old practice. A call from a surgeon a couple of days afterwards is incredible for patients. They love it. Oh my God, you're calling me? I've never had a doctor call me at home before. Well, why not? And I call them on my phone without my number blocked, right? If there's a problem, I want to hear about it. I want them to call me. We live in a small enough state. As Rachel was saying, these people are our neighbors. <laughs> They'll be banging on my door. I do home visits. I've taken people to surgery. It, it's a great place that we live in, and I think we need to appreciate that. Part of what this day is about, actually, is appreciating all the things that we are doing innovatively and for our patients, your patients. Um, I, I wonder, I don't know, Dr. Leffler or Rachel, do you have any questions for the folks from Copley? Just thought I'd open that up in case you do. Uh, you know, this is Rachel. I, I appreciate and wrote down some of the things you're doing. I love the example of the card sent to the patient and the surgeon calling the patient. I, I learn things with every system I talk to. I learn things that we can talk about doing here. You know, I think um, you're, we're all trying to tackle the same thing. I think learning from each other is uh, incredible. And so I just appreciate the opportunity to be here. I don't, I don't know that I have any questions. I think we're, we're all challenged with the same things. Um, heard from you about layering education. I think that's important. We don't have classes for all our patients. We don't, our, our shoulder patients like yours don't go through a class because of volume. We only, I think, have 80 to 100 a year. So have similar challenges, but anything I can learn from anyone, I will take back to my group as an opportunity. So just really appreciate this opportunity to hear what you're doing as well. And I will take those learning back. Agreed. Great. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just throw out there, how do we, this has been, you know, we, have, we still have one more uh, panelist, but how do we continue these conversations? I, mean, I, I wonder actually if there's a role for boss or if there's a role for how do we start to have these conversations even internally in Vermont for learning? And I think boss is already doing that, but how do we do more? I guess I'll just throw that out there. But um, any board questions? All right. 
So I think Christina needed a minute just to change some of the PowerPoint, right? That is Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, you're on now in big school screen, so. Hi. <laughs> I know there's gonna be, I don't know if you're muted. Um, Thank you. So um, I'm going to change the focus a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about um, emergency medicine. I'm an ER doc by training, and so this is a project we worked on. And I will say that we are working on a, a joint project right now across the UVM Health Network, uh, working on the same issues. Where do people get discharged to? How do you standardize the process? How do you make sure people get PT on the for All the things that we're hearing are, are the things that are on our plate. So uh, that was very helpful. And so um, I want to just mention that we're doing this. Am I driving this? network perspective, I just wanted to outline what is the imperative. And so clearly in a fee-for-service model, that pays for volume and incentivizes doing more cases. And so if you can drive down your cost of care so you can reduce your cost, you may be able to drive more cases. But the all-payer model really is a value-based system. And it allows for investments to keep the population healthier. So when the question came, where could money come from to do this, I would argue pretty strongly that in, uh, when you're under capitation or a fixed payment perspective, there's dollars in the system to drive process improvement and change. And just to repeat that, the all-payer model margin is not generated by volume, not by doing more cases, but it really comes from quality and high efficiency in doing the exact right case on the right patients. At the UVM Health Network, we have a network quality council. It um, meets every other month. On the committee, we have clinical leaders, chairs, we have quality directors, we have chief medical officers, chief nursing officers, project improvement leaders across the network. And um, we have a tool right now um, called PEAK. It's a tool from Kaufman Hall that really lets us see the cost per case that we do across the network at all of our sites, and it mixes with clinical data. So we can combine them together. And uh, the Network Quality Council is very focused on care variation and cost data. So you look at that every month on a dashboard to help us make decisions about what we're going to look at. So how do we choose projects? So there's really um, four different areas that we focus on. The first one is utilization. It may be that one area is doing a lot more CAT scans for a particular diagnosis, one of the ERs maybe, um, we, um, or is using more of a certain antibiotic for certain kinds of cases. There may be variation within a specialty around how cardi what kind of stents cardiology is using is something we're looking at right now. We do look at overall cost data per episode of care and then quality outcomes. And once again, we have a tool, I was asking about the tool, to help us pick and choose our projects. One of the first projects that we picked and we have some data on is we noted that in emergency medicine, we were admitting a lot of people with chest pain who within 24 to 36 hours would go home to the back home and not have a diagnosis of heart disease. Very common issue. And so uh, we knew, I'll show you some data, that in 2014, we were admitting about 30% of people who had presented to the University of Vermont Medical Center emergency department with chest pain. One out of three of them were getting admitted. And a relatively small amount of number of those people actually have heart disease. So you could call those admissions waste. These people are coming in the hospital, they're getting extensive testing, um, it's expensive, it's un the patients don't want to stay overnight, and most importantly, it was using up beds we needed for other people. We're full almost all the time. And so um, 
I thought I would just talk quickly about how, what, in 2014, if someone showed up at our ED with a complaint of chest pain, most of them get an EKG, <clears throat> and they were getting a blood test, and then based on those two pieces of information, the doctor was making a decision, oftentimes with cardiology, to admit those people for what we call serial enzymes. They're getting a number of blood tests over 24 to 36 hours. At the end of that testing, they would oftentimes undergo some further cardiac test and then be discharged. And we knew that of that 30% of people being admitted, somewhere around five to 8% actually have heart disease. So a small number. So we knew there was a big opportunity there. So the Network Quality Council said, those admissions are not adding value to any part of the system. And so we built a project where we um, wanted to see if we could streamline that process. So as I said, we knew in 2014 that 32% of our patients were being admitted, and most of them are going home within 36 hours. And in 2014 and 15, a better test was developed. So the test we were using became much more sensitive. And there was a paper that came out that said if you could do this test twice over three hours, that was negative both times, and a couple other things came together, that most of these people could go home. And so we worked with cardiology to make sure that we were using the right test. And pathology helped us so we could get two tests back in three hours, 24-7. That was some work we had to do. And um, in 2018, utilizing this new process, we only admitted 15% of chest pain patients. Careful follow-up, we've carefully tracked every person we've sent home, and we've really not found any missed heart attacks. So uh, we know this new procedure works 99.8% of the time. So sooner or later, there will be a miss. But it's been very successful so far. We actually think there's even ways to mitigate um, even that risk percentage, because we don't force you to follow the protocol. You can still admit people around the protocol if necessary. So what exactly did we do? So in 15, this better test comes out. We meet with our cardiology colleagues, make sure they agree with this process of sending more people home. We work with pathology to make sure the test is available 24 seven, we're using the right one, we have a good mechanism to get it back in a timely fashion. And we realize that this protocol doesn't mean that no one needs to have further testing, it means it's safe to go home tonight from the ER. So we wanted to be certain that we had really robust cardiology follow-up. So in 18, once we're gonna send someone home, I can click an order at discharge that gets them a cardiology appointment within three days. That's really important in this. This doesn't work if you don't have cardiology saying, we'll always see the patient within three days. And we pick three days so that if you come in Friday evening, you could be seen Monday. That's how we do it. Um, in 16, we start testing the system. We're using the new blood test. We're doing the test twice as the protocol says. And we're starting to send very select patients home. We're starting to look, who do we think is really okay to go home? Are they really getting a follow-up appointment? Is it really happening? Are they getting good testing when they leave? Is cardiology able to get them in and get timely tests scheduled? And are there any problems? And it really goes very smoothly. In 2017, we train all the providers on the new protocol and we make some changes in our EMR, which is epic, to make this change durable and so that, um, as I always say, it's easier to do it right than it is to do it wrong. And in 2018, we have full implementation across our emergency department. So this is a quick slide. So I just told you in 14, we're admitting about one out of three chest pain patients who present to the University of Vermont Emergency Department. And in 2018, we admitted 15%. This is important because, as I told you, there still may be reasons, even if someone has two negative tests, to get admitted. And we didn't tell the providers, you have to send the patient home. And so if you look across the bottom here, here is the emergency department doctors at the University of Vermont. This is transparent data. They've all seen this. They're well, they know I'm showing it to you today. <laughs> They're comfortable. If you look right in the middle, there's a guy named Leffler. <laughs> and so in 15, or sorry, in 2014, I was admitting about 15% of my patients. And that sounds really great, but I have to tell you the truth. I work mostly day shifts now. It's very easy for Leffler to get a cardiology consult on a day shift. So someone I was worried about, even in 15, I could get a consult, they could come down, they could do a stress test. So I was able to send more people home than my partner, Dr. Weimersheimer, who works a lot of night shifts. He's still seeing some people who he's worried about who can't get a cardiology test at three o'clock in the morning. 
So what I want you to understand from this slide is we didn't say we expect everyone to be at 15% or whatever. We said we're going to try drive out unnecessary variation. And what I'm most interested in on this slide is if you look in 14, the blue lines, there's a lot of variability amongst us. If you look on the orange lines in 18, we've really reduced variation. We've really squeezed that down. We're not looking for no variation. There may be a very good reason for someone to stay, even with a negative test. But we were able to drive out a lot of excess variation by following this protocol closely. And we, when we show this in our meetings, we say, look, there's, you can see some people are doing it a little different. What's going on? Next steps. We're going to continue robust follow-up. We need to really track these patients and, not, and make sure we're not having people go home who are having heart attacks, who get lost to follow-up, who don't go to cardiology, who are getting tests in cardiology that meant they should have stayed in the hospital. We want to test treadmill testing in the ED, I won't say 24-7, but for more hours, because that is a way to even eliminate the necessary cardiology follow-up, but that could have a big length of stay issue, and we have other issues going on in the EDs right now with borders and so on. So we want to be smart about doing that. But when you can do that on that initial visit, it's extremely efficient. Patients love it. And then you can be done with the complete workup in that one quick visit. As we said in every presentation, you have to have good data. You have to have data that um, the providers believe that they can test and poke their fingers at and that they can look at and play with. Um, I will tell you that as we're rolling out Epic across the network, we can't wait. Because once we have Epic for all of our hospitals, and Epic has a lot of tools in it, we'll be able to give even more powerful data in real time, and providers will be able to build their own dashboards and easily compare themselves against their colleagues, see who has best practice, and then in real time learn from each other. And um, we're, like I said, it's important to know your local dynamics. So if you looked at that last slide, you'd say, well, it looks like Leffler's great and Weimarschein is bad, but that's totally not true. It depends on knowing what's going on what other issues, if Dr. Macy's taking care of uh, more sicker patients than his partner, he may have a longer length of stay that may be totally reasonable. So you have to combine this data with local expertise. And we're already applying some of this work to other pathways like for um, blood clots in the lung and so on. Summary, in 2018 we saved 270 bed nights. That's a hard number, we know that. We kept people out of the hospital who didn't need to stay overnight. We freed up beds for other patients who needed to be in the hospital and transferred to us. Um, conservatively, we believe we saved $750,000. If you look at Medicare reimbursement for hospital admission, Medicaid, and commercial, inpatient testing costs more than outpatient testing, so we, we're confident that's a, a conservative number. We allowed for much more outpatient testing, freeing up our inpatient capacity for other patients. And most importantly, as you move towards capitation, part of that really important holy grail is to do as much care out of the hospital as possible and so this was a great example of where we could provide hospital level care in an outpatient setting and i'll stop there and be happy to take questions thank you that's another glimpse in a different area where there's yeah. obviously important work being done but i guess that the first thing i'll do is obviously open it up to our other panelists if you have questions for dr leffler so that sounds like a great test but I think it's really important, as you pointed out, is to have the availability of services, like cardi getting somebody into cardiology in two to three days. That is key to make this innovation work, right? Yes. And, and so how, how do you approach your cardiologists and you know, herd your cats and get them all in line? So what really helped us a lot is, is that um, we were able to say to our cardiologists, look, if you're willing to see people nine to five, Monday through Friday, we'll cons consult you less to the ED. We'll ask for less consults. And as soon as we said that, they were all on board. They couldn't wait to get called less. So if the way we do it now, if you have two of this test, troponin test negative twice, an unremarkable EKG and no other concerning factors, we don't cardi consult cardiology in the ED, which also saves a lot of money. And we send the person home with a three-day follow-up. And as long as that's working seamlessly, we're doing many less consults, which is good for the cardiologists, good for the patients, and, and good for the system. Steve, that was a nice presentation. Uh, one, one question I have, if you save 750 bed nights, it potentially allows you to provide access to care uh, to other patients, so other service lines in your hospital. And over the time since you've uh, implemented this change, 
have you had like a discussion with the other service lines as far as easier to get patients transferred in from an outside facility, uh, allowing uh, uh, further ease for patients to egress out of the OR to the floor. Uh, anyway, if you, if you have any comments. Um, if you've been trying to transfer it into us recently, you know that we are constantly having issues right now with capacity. Um, we desperately need the Miller Billing to come on board. We can't wait. But we have right now every single day issues with managing how many patients need our services. So this was just immediately consumed with other people. I would like to tell you, I think we're able to accept more transfers from this extra 270 bed nights, but um, it just got sucked up in all the other need right now, to be honest with you. Anybody else have any other? So is this a program that you would recommend to the community setting, community hospitals? It's a great question, John. So without question, and so I would say that um, One Care Vermont is aware of this project they're having Dr. Harrington, who is our ED leader, present it through a One Care Learning Collaborative to roll it out across the state. And the work, you're exactly right, in a community hospital, you have to make sure you have the right test, it's available 24 seven, you can do it twice, and that you could arrange close follow-up. But really, it's not um, a high technology change. It's really having appropriate resources available. So we're hopeful that most One Care hospital systems and health service areas will adopt this program because we think there's a big opportunity across the state of Vermont. All right, thank you. Anybody from the board? Yeah, um, just along that, I think that the first thing, um, you know, a couple things that Rachel said that really stuck out to me was improvement, um, not judgment. And I think your chart shows that, right? Because if you looked at that and you say, oh, this person is better than another, it's, it's not about that. It, it was about everybody had improvement. And the other thing was um, that I really think we can take across the whole system you were just touching on is, you know, collaborate and compete. You know, and, and how do we do that across the system with this as one example, which hopefully we'll go through one care, but you know the examples that you gave at Copley, you know there are examples throughout the whole system, and you know it would really be great to see the hospitals, you know, having whether it's a consortium or something where, you know, like, like to like, you can compare things and, and look at how do we how do we do better to make quality decisions throughout the, all the systems, you know, and obviously to some degree UVM has more resources to be able to you know attack some of these problems than some of the other hospitals but you know it sounds like Copley you guys are talking you know throughout the country to people about how do you improve but it would be great to have forums to kind of share that you know at least through Vermont so we can get some of those savings in the system and you know I love this example you know because it showed seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of, of savings but you know, we don't see that in the hospital budget presentation because it's not there, right? So, so it, you know, but it's a good thing to be able to illustrate, you know, we would have had higher costs in our system, you know, without these types of things. So, you know, I think you guys shouldn't be shy about sharing a lot more of those because it really helps to see, you know, what you're doing along these lines. I thought it was, you know, this whole thing has been really informative. Thanks. All right, I'd love to open it up to public comment, but I just want to echo Maureen's comments that this has been very inspiring. And I mean, I think we keep, you know, hearing about this all pair model and, and hope that we're starting to see the, the kinds of delivery reform changes that we think is incentivized by the new payment system. And these are examples of, of exactly that, changes that we hope that would make improvements in population health and reduce costs, which are the goals of the model. Um, and so I echo your point about more forum, more opportunities to share this kind of information across providers, across the network. I think One Care and Vox have fantastic roles for that. So I would love to open it up to public comment. Dale. Um, did I hear her name correctly, Rachel? Sorry, Rachel, right? yes. Huh? Rachel? Yeah. Yes, I'm uh, still here. I can, I can almost hear you. Oh, I'm not the only one that has hearing problems. That's good. <laughs> Um, so, it, you mentioned macro and micro. Can you hear me now? Yeah. There's yes, I can. There's also what they call meso. So, you have macro, micro, meso is right in between the two. And sure. it's got to do with that, like, meso culture. 
So I was looking at, you've got 21 counties, you've got three states, you've got a very diverse culture or cultures that you're serving. And I see you shared in different, uh, oh, you shared in a different way the cultural shift or what is a cultural shift it sounds like it's also a community cultural shift. It's not just in the hospital, in the setting. It's also, was there a shift within the community as far as their perception? What is the debt of persons within the community? Because you said it went back to the community as far as the savings, and they weren't so interested in how, like, the incentive was not that they needed some of that savings themselves, but that doesn't answer the question of where are they at in their own personal costs, where are they at in the costs within the community. Um, and you mentioned a three-hour meal. Um, we have a two-foot snowstorm coming maybe. We could probably do a three-hour meal. Um, uh, yeah. Cultural thinking, there was a shift. Time management, I was wondering, did you slow down? And that actually made things better? Did, you, did your time management change? Did your perception of it change? That's a lot of questions in there, Dale, for, for Rachel. Rachel, did you get all of those? Sure, I can give it a shot. You know, I think, um, I think there, Gunderson is, has had a shift in our strategic plan in that we do have an in, intentional focus on population health. And to do that, it means engaging our community, our partners, our patients differently. And so I think you're right there, we can have an institutional cultural shift, but it also takes a community cultural shift and a shift on the part of our patients to be successful in some of these things. Um, I heard uh, from, from one of the panelists, I think about uh, clarifying or trying to best define patient expectation on the front end. And so we are focusing, not just in orthopedics, but I know across the system, on patient education and community education so that our patients know what to expect and what is reasonable and why we're trying to do what we're doing and how it impacts them. So we aren't just engaging our team in the why, we're trying to engage the community in the why, and I think that's important. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can you clarify the rest of your question? I think there was a question uh, about time management. time management. Time yeah. management slowing down, right? So I think if I would have brought this plan to the surgeons and said, this will slow you down, that would probably not have gone well. So in anything <laughs> we do, we try to be very respectful of the practices and productivity and the processes of our providers. Um, this was a time intensive process, but the point was to get the right data on how long things took. So we didn't, our intention wasn't to slow things down um, in this. Have we done some things that sometimes take more time to then have better outcomes on the back end? Sure, I think the caregiver class is one thing. Um, the nurses might have been able to offer that same education in the room in the midst of doing other things, but we thought having intentional time pulling a resource aside um, to have an actual dedicated caregiver class where that education was delivered without the patients in the room so the caregivers could focus, that we felt like was an investment and maybe is taking a bit more time, but we're seeing strong outcomes and feedback from our um, patient caregivers on the back end. So, you know, I think we also, from a time management perspective, we tried to invest a lot of administrative resources to not get in the way of the provider resources engaged in this project. So I think that's important, um, that we're just very respectful of the providers in these things. And, you know, I, I just, I love the presentation about cardiology. I just think that's incredible and I can put my heart institute hat back on. And a lot of changes we're making in a fee-for-service model negatively impact us. So we made a change. Uh, we were doing a blood type and screen on every patient um, pre-op for a while. And then we started looking at our tra blood transfusion rates and talking to our blood bank about blood availability and realized that testing was unnecessary cost that was being passed along to the patient. 
Our transfusion rate was so low, um, almost all the patients we were transfusing were anemic, so we knew that ahead of time for that. And we, we weren't transfusing in the case, it was usually there to have the case in the blood bank had time to get the blood we needed in those cases. So that's something that um, was a savings to our patients and to our community, but actually in a deeper service world cost us money, but that's our commitment, right? But that's a culture change. Um, so I, I don't know if I fully answered your entire question. Yes, yes yeah. you did, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Deb Richter, I'm a family physician, uh, also uh, in Cambridge, Vermont, also chair of Vermont Healthcare for All. Actually, I actually have a question sort of more to the board, um, because I think we are, these are all excellent, wonderful presentations, um, and I admire these physicians greatly. Um, and I think it's wonderful, except that we still have a tremendous access problem. So a lot of these problems could be prevented. And I would ask that you, you would widen the scope of looking for cost savings by looking around the world and realizing that the rest of the industrialized world covers everyone for half the cost with better outcomes. They live longer. And they go to the doctor more often, in fact. They have more hospital days. There are more admissions. And some even have more transplants. So, so clearly, we're doing a lot wrong in this country. And of course, there's the article of Ubi Reinhardt, it's the price is stupid. We have a much more expensive infrastructure, probably more intensive hospital beds than we need for a population, et cetera. But the other thing is the whole idea of public funding and budgeting and all, there's many other ways that these countries save money and spend less. And it's not about fee-for-service, because again, most of them are fee-for-service. So that is really not the problem, not a great way to pay doctors, but, and certainly we, and I think the idea of you know, the salaries is, is clearly one of the reasons this is working so well. Um, but also that they are able to do health planning for a population. And I am getting to a question, but I also want to make the point that our administrative costs in the healthcare system are around 31% of total. We've seen in the last, since 1975, a 32%, a 3200% increase in the number of healthcare administrators. At the same time, 150% increase in the number of doctors since 1970. We've not looked at that. We're not looking at the ground beneath our feet. We're adding more administration to the healthcare system. So that is my one thing, is that for us to examine the administrative costs in healthcare as one way to look at how can we reduce that. It's driving doctors absolutely nuts with all of the administration and the administrative tasks that we have to deal with. The second is primary care is dying. Primary care is circling the drain. Um, a lot of doctors, I'm in Lamoille County, are, are retiring and we're getting increased. Plus, my patients don't have access because they have five and $10,000 deductibles. So it seems to me that we're putting the cart before the horse. I think these are wonderful delivery system changes. They're absolutely needed, but we need to look at systemic reform uh, first. And I would just ask that you consider addressing administrative costs and the idea of at least starting with primary care and expanding access to all Vermonters, um, you know, at least first dollar coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. I think anybody can jump in here, but one of the things I would like to say is, you know, there is an increase, the all-care model does have shift resources towards primary care. The realization that primary care is incredibly important, preventative health is incredibly important, I think is well recognized by all of us here on the board. And I would also just like to point to a letter that we sent to the legislative committees um, was that in December? Asking them to look carefully at the administrative burden that is imposed on providers, and in particular to look into gold carding to reduce uh, higher authorization. So that was a, a letter from the board to the legislative committees to address that very issue. So we're very well aware of it and trying to do some things that we can in our power to do that. We had a panel actually conversation back in several months before that about administrative burden. And so we, it's on our, on our minds and we think about it. So I don't think wants to jump in on anything on that. Okay. So oh. not to jump in on that, but if I could just take us far afield for a second, since we have Dr. Richter who's practicing in Memorial County and we have <coughs> two doctors on the panel uh, practicing in Memorial County, do any of you have any ideas why uh, Memorial is such an outlier on the uninsured rate? I think there's probably, um, what, what I'm seeing is that the cost of insurance is not worth it for most patients who are in a position to take a look at their finances and say, 
look, I can either um, you know, pay for my deductible here you know, and, and then really get nothing for my insurance. I mean, I'm seeing that, you know, I, I think, first that, of all, I think the insurance... But that kind of analysis wouldn't be any different if you're in Memorial or if you're in Rutland. And, and again, I don't know if it's just sort of the number of people who are, um, like, independent. Um, I have a lot of patients working in construction who are uninsured. Um, it's very expensive for them. And, and again, it's not worth the cost. There's not much value to the insurance they're buying. Um, so most of them decide to go uninsured and then pay directly for their care. I, I don't know if, and why that is any different, really. Um, I think it might just be the, the jobs that are available. I mean, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're chuckling up here. And we, we think that one of the biggest problems is the, the lack of job opportunities. And there's just no, no opportunity for a lot of these younger families, a lot of these uh, uh, breadwinners. And the other problem is a lot of these people make just enough money to not be eligible for certain things. Like Medicare, I mean Medicaid, and, you know, and that, that that just throws them for a loop. You know, somebody who makes a thousand dollars more is nowhere near has the ability to pay for health care. Sorry, the purpose. No, no, I think it's a great question because I had seen that data. We just saw that data that Memorial County is an outlier. Ken. Yes, thank you, Ken Lurtoff. I want to uh, express my disdain for Deb Richter for. Raising my blood pressure. On <laughs> 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 your birthday, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> Having the nerve to, to raise the question of administrative costs. So I, I do have a question, but I, I just have to editorialize for a minute and say I appreciate the fact that the board has sent a letter to the legislature on this issue. I can't tell you how dismayed I am about the board's lack of taking up this initiative a couple of months ago when I asked for a freeze on the highest salaries and a comparative study of three years of what the increase has been for administrators versus direct service providers. And basically, the board said, we don't want to intervene and get involved in internal discussions. This is an unacceptable position. You are the regulators. I urge you to partner with the legislature, but they're not the regulators. You are. And it's a dangerous game to play to not take on the responsibility that you have. So that's just a commentary. I will add one more thing. I hope the board will take up sometime soon publicly the fact that administrators in Vermont hospitals who are making a million dollars or more uh, have to pay a 21% tax. And I presume that there's a plan for where that money's gonna come from. If tradition holds true, it'll end up being the the consumer who ends up paying the penalty in the end. But it's just another example of the escalating costs that occur when reins are not placed on administrative burden, which I wasn't going to raise necessarily, but since somebody did, I felt like I had to comment. I do want to say that I think the presentation is uh, uplifting. And it reminds me of a, of a conversation that the Green Mountain Care Board must have had about five years ago that I was at, where it had a whole host of practitioners come in to actually address issues to the Green Mountain Care Board. It was, it was some group, maybe Alan Ramsey was involved with putting it together. And it was, it was very uplifting. One is because it's always great to hear from people who actually do the work. Um, very often at the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, we hear from you know CEOs or CFOs, and I in no way want to disparage them or say that they're not riveting in their presentations. But there's a different quality about hearing people who have left from treating patients and can explain you know their point of view. So the question I have to, to those who presented, and this is tricky. It's like a trick question in a way. Um, back then, when the when the host of uh, Providers, I have to say, many of them were young providers in their careers. They all, they all kind of agreed that one goal that Vermont had to have was reduce the number of beds that are being utilized for a variety of reasons. One arguing that a lot of work could be done outside the hospital. And in some ways, it was kind of a radical presentation. I kind of guess that's one of the reasons they were never invited back because of the power structure. That message just didn't go over real well. But it was profound for somebody sitting there. And so, in some ways, the presentation might argue today that there's less usage of beds or bed space. 
and, and it's tricky in the sense that one theory might be that there's so much demand that, that it's a false economy to think that there'll be any savings. You know, you, you throw out a figure, whatever it is, a million dollars, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. But is it really a savings? Will it ever show up in a budget that's presented to the Green Mountain Care Board now or five years from now? Because the hospitals are also uh, money-making endeavors, and they have, you know, a business model that I don't think has come in here ever to say we've been able to reduce. Uh, the expenditures in cardiology at the UVM Medical Network by 4% or 10%, so we're asking for less. But do you feel like in cardiology there's been a reduction in the overall car cardiology budget? Yeah, so my, my, my first comment is that um, every presentation you heard here today was about how to get more people cared for out of the hospital. All our orthopedic presentations were about decreasing length of stay. Ours was about saving bed nights for admissions. The trick is that if you look at demographics and you look at what's happening to our population, um, there are not many people who come in with acute issues right now that need to stay in the hospital very long. In the old days, they would stay for four, five, six days for a total joint. We did a cardiology patient for four days. That was very good in the fee for service model. They were relatively easy to take care of. Our hospitals are filled now with people who are elderly with chronic health conditions who are hard to discharge back to home. And so the people who can go home quickly and easily, we're working hard on. And the, the second part of that, the much harder piece is to make sure we have good systems in our communities, enough nursing home beds, enough step down beds, enough other resources for people who have three, four, or five comorbidities who can't really go home but don't need inpatient care. And on any day at the medical center in Burlington, we can have 15 to 30 patients who could be discharged if we had an appropriate place for them to go, including maybe their home with extra support, but we don't have that. So it's very complex to figure out how to help cut down even a single bed day for those people because it's not just health care, they need other social supports. It's a com complex answer to your question, but. I mean, I will tell you that if you look across any service that we provide for acute care, most all of them the length of stay is less. But our overall length of stay goes up because the people who have to be in the hospital need to be in longer, who need to stay. Steve gave a complicated answer. I'd like to give an easy answer. Outpatient joint replacement. It's coming. It's being done nationally. It's going to start. Hopefully, we're, we're doing some patients, outpatients, as Brian was saying, partial knee replacements go home that same day. Total joint replacements, knees, hips, shoulders, can absolutely go home the same day with the right services. And I, we, have, we have somebody here who really wants to head in that direction, and I'm gonna let him speak about that one. Yeah, so just to make a comment, and, it, and it's taking, and I've been in practice for 10 years, and um, the concept is the, the total joint patient, if, if we look at a program we have in place to risk gratify them, and understand ahead of time what, what we might be encountering, I think really helps. And a patient who undergoes a joint replacement is not sick. I mean, you go to the hospital, you see in the hospitals, you're sick. So these patients actually need a special type of care, but they're not ill, they're actually well. And so we have concepts of they need to learn how to mobilize, put their shoes and socks on, get off the toilet, take a shower, they need to understand their medications, and they need to be having adequate pain control, they need to be eating and drinking. And these are all services through education and other resources that I think we can accomplish giving high quality care uh, to this population. And so I, I think maybe trying to look at uh, some of uh, you know, what you had uh, demonstrated through your project is, the way I look at it is you may not see um, a reduction or a change in the budget, but what you're seeing is potentially greater access. And that may be perceived as a smaller community. If you're freeing up 270 bed nights, then there may be a complex patient that's not appropriate for the uh, community uh, setting, that has an easier chance of getting transferred in the day they present to our ER than actually staying potentially with some questionable clinical concerns uh, for another day. Um, and so I actually see uh, uh, Steve's presentation as being very enlightening and hopefully help, helping us in a small community, other communities, uh, get patients that need to be in a tertiary care center there. I'm a consumer, and uh, on Saturday I will be 82 years old. That's my birthday. 
Uh, and uh, I've been following what Deb has said and what Ken has said. I agree entirely with what they've said. I'm also a patient family advisor at Central Vermont Medical Center, which is part of the UVM network. However, we do not have Epic yet. I have, I have passwords to get into UVM MC that don't talk to uh, Central Vermont Medical Center. I'd like to know from you, sir, when are we going to get <laughs> Epic in Central Vermont? In one year, it's coming. One year, and then I can get the same messages and they won't be outdated by the time I get them. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say to the knee trans, the knee surgeons, I was scheduled to have knee surgery here at Central Vermont Medical Center. I have canceled it. I, I first, I, I postponed it. But I had said, I want to have a bed waiting for me at Woodridge Nursing Home because I live alone, I have no support network, uh, and I live in an apartment. I can get meals on wheels, but it's a little hard for me. I use a cane already. I have peripheral neuropathy. I have a million other problems as well. And I feel so much better because I canceled my surgery and said, I don't think my knees are the biggest problem in my life. I can still walk. That's, I just wanted to make that comment, and I agree with what everything they say, but I, I also was concerned that this group, the Gunderson group, they have no patient family advisors on their committees, right? It's all about the providers, nothing, ab and uh, the staff, the administrative, and, and the, um, providers and they have no feedback from the consumer. I'd like some comment on that. Rachel, did you hear that by chance? About whether yes, it's and I absolutely input? appreciate that. Yes, and, and we, we do have many patient family advisory committees in our organization and we definitely take changes, process changes and ideas to them for feedback. Um, as we have worked hard on our patient education and caregiver education and classes, we actually have worked with our patients and their caregivers to get feedback on those processes to make sure that we are taking uh, into account what is working for them. So I do appreciate that our patients have, and their families have to be partners with us in this. So I do appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I think it was one more comment over there. Yeah. I I'm Lewis Myers, a primary care uh, physician uh, for many years, hospitalist now, but my heart's still in primary care. And, uh, you know, a fairly wise person wrote into the VT Digger, which is our uh, online newspaper here in the state, recently said, first we were patients, then we were customers, and now we are algorithms. And I think right. that while the algorithms are very helpful uh, in their place, and particularly for the surgical specialties, and because you get into more complex areas like primary care, I think you overestimate or underestimate perhaps people's uh, dismay at being treated as an algorithm and not as a person. And I think there is going to be a blowback at some point, and um, not sure where that's going to occur, uh, but I think you need to keep that in mind. Um, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I, well, I just want to, I read that comment, and I forget who wrote it, too, but uh, he's right on the money. Um, one of the things I had as I listened to this presentation was that when you go to a primary care physician, and you're lucky if you get 10 minutes. So how, you know, you, they just ran you through and ran you out. And I've been through that, you know, it's that algorithm mode again, and dead comment about access is the big one. Lamoille, hardly any jobs up there. The salaries don't equal the cost. It's the same all over the state, not just Lamoille. But, but I have, you know, that's a question I had. If you go into a physician's office, whether it's this or that, it's wham, bam, thank you, sir. You know, that's it. So that's a comment. Thank you, yep. Any other comments? Yeah. <laughs> Clarification. 
how do I save, how did I save anybody money as far as the affordability of the health care? I, I can't find the measurement as I've been listening that actually shows that somebody saw that they didn't spend a hundred dollars they were going to have to spend or how do I prove the savings to the actual patient and all that we've heard? I believe it's a clarification question. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to tackle that clarification question? Well, I, I can tackle it if you want. I mean, so all of our medical expenditures, right, year over year, they build up. And so this is spending that we're not seeing entering into the system. So, for example, in our, I'll give this an example in our insurance rate hearings. We hear about, the, you know, the insurance rate premiums are set for next year based on the historical medical expenditure from the prior year, right? This is expenditure that does not happen. Therefore, it's not being folded into future premium increases. It's savings that you're not actually necessarily going to be able to quantify all the time, but it's we're, we're bending the cost curve in ways that are going to reduce you know, uh, insurance premiums in, in future years, reduce costs for consumers, and free up resources so that patients can have better access to health insurance, presumably if the costs of insurance are slowing down. And to the extent that there are there keeping people in the hospital that need to be there, freeing up beds, it's gonna increase access to those beds for the patients who really need it. Need it. So that would be one answer. Can, can I just respond to that though? Because I, I think we are just neglecting the whole issue of fixed costs. And the fact that if you look in the hospital system, especially in a place like Gunderson where the majority of people are, are salary, and again, 65% of physicians in Vermont are salary, we, there's a study showing that 83% of hospital costs are fixed. So what they don't spend, their 750000 ends up getting shifted anyway. So that doesn't really do much for system costs. So I think that really needs to be looked at. I think Dale's question is well taken. Does that really happen? Maybe it does in a variable cost. You don't buy a drug, then it doesn't enter the system, but not so much in, in the issue of fixed costs. Lauren, did you want to add that? Uh, yeah, I think what, what I saw in some of the examples um, at UM and Gunderson, you know, and at Copley, is if you were the individual that was going into the ER and you would have been admitted, you would have had costs that would, you would have been charged for for that overnight stay, for the testing, for everything else, and now you're not getting those costs. So on an individual level, if you're actually, if, if you're not having those costs incurred or if you're no longer staying overnight in the hospital when you have your um, surgeries, right, you're not incurring those costs if, it's, if it was deductible. So it, it does, in those cases, I think, are examples where it would go back to the individual as well. No, I, I think that's a good example. Um, and it has an impact on staff overtime, upscaling, I mean, beds are open for tonight, and there is a direct impact on patients who get to go home. It's cheaper if you have a big deductible. It's cheaper for the testing that you get as an outpatient than an inpatient. Um, so I agree with your assessment. Oh, Mary Alice. Could I comment again on, on costs? Because I'm a Medicare recipient, quite obviously. I don't get Medicaid, I live in subsidized housing, I get food stamps, uh, but I pay $225 a month for a co-insurance through United Healthcare that I've had forever, and that was the reason I thought maybe I could go to a nursing home for two weeks and have some rest and use some of that co-insurance that I've been paying for so long on and get some value from it. I also pay $30 a month for my Humana Part D. I think you think that the only people that pay for their health care are young people. Older people do too. Yep. All right, okay, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think the uh, discussion was uh, a very helpful one. And uh, I did want to extend an invitation to Ken to spend from five to seven at the Green Mountain Care Board office tonight with our monthly PCAG meeting. Um, since you primary care advisory group are not sure that we're hearing from doctors on a regular basis.
Other than that, is there any old business to come before the board? Before you adjourn, actually, before Rachel, you hang up, I just want to, sorry, I mentioned, thank Rachel, thank doctors here that took the time, you know, out of your very, very busy day, obviously, um, to enlighten us all. And I, I found it personally very inspiring, and I really want to thank you. And Rachel, thank you as well. You still are on the phone. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciated the discussion, and I'm taking some learning back to my team as well. Thank you, everyone. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Excuse me. Is there a motion to adjourn? To move and second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you.